With more games getting released every year and an absolutely crowded indie scene, there's pretty much a game for everyone these days. But then some consumers argue that games are actually getting worse. They're lacking new ideas and the industry is in a kind of plateau, maybe even heading towards another crash. Well, now we've finally got some statistics to back up all our bitching and moaning. In a study conducted by Finder using data gathered from Metacritic, the research group found that only eight games released in 2016 had an aggregate score of 90 or higher. That's compared with 20 games Games scoring 90 or higher in 2009. A clear drop off over seven years. This generation has had some properly amazing games already. The likes of Bloodborne, The Witcher 3 and Uncharted 4, which we all agree is f***ing incredible. Seriously, climbing and shooting and, and climbing, amazing. <laughs> You're gonna get roasted for that, Mike. You're gonna get absolutely roasted. I mean, you got to wonder, do Metacritic scores even really matter? There's a lot of contention whether or not they're actually that important. But you've got to acknowledge that within the industry, you know, the developers and the publishers, they do put a lot of weight in them. It's a story we've mentioned before about Fallout New Vegas, Obsidian. Uh, they didn't get the bonus, you know, that they would do because the game got 84 on Metacritic and not 85, which is f***ing bollocks, you know. So they, they, they do put a lot of weight in it within the industry. But then again, you know, as, as a consumer, do you put a lot of weight in Metascores? I don't really, yeah. I don't really consult Metacritic before, <clears throat> before I, buying a game. I do, but if you don't, who are your favourite reviewers? Let us know down in the comments. But there has actually been a steady decline in the average review scores of games, and you can kind of see why. The trend in the games industry lately has been to rush games to the market for fear of missing potential release dates and hurting carefully scheduled marketing campaigns. So the quality of games inevitably takes a hit as a result. Marketing budgets are so big now that moving things around on the calendar starts getting very expensive. So rushing games to market is all too common these days, with games missing features or being extremely buggy on release, and this reflects in review scores. One classic example is Battlefield 4. That game was released in a terrible state with bugs and glitches all over the place. But a year after release, the game was polished to a lovely shine, with more features patched in. It became one of the most played shooters across all platforms and was an excellent multiplayer showcase. Games get reviewed when they get released, but these days games aren't always finished. When they're released, they get updated and patched up to a year, maybe two years after that fact. And the Metacritic scores that you see on the website are from the release date. They don't actually reflect what the game is like in its current state. But this rush to release certainly isn't the only reason for a drop in average review scores. There's a lot of things going on here. One thing to consider is the fact that reviewers in recent years have changed their tone to be a bit more critical of games, and some consumers argue that one of the reasons for that more critical approach is to generate ad revenue for websites by getting people outraged and clicking on these negative reviews. Clickbaiting their audience into reading their content. You won't catch any of that shit on Pretty Good Gaming. You could also argue there are simply too many games coming out, and the quality has simply been diluted because of this. Maybe with so many games saturating certain genres, like all that survival crafting tripe on Steam, annual Call of Duty installments, and the fact we've had 17 Assassin's Creed titles since 2007, critics are getting sick of playing the same game over and over again. Critics more than anyone crave originality and new ideas, so when a series like COD keeps releasing iterative installments, each one more forgettable and unoriginal than the last, it's easy to see how it can all start blurring into one. There is serious oversaturation of the market, with almost 40% of the games on Steam being released in 2016 alone, and with a bunch of them being piss poor student projects or half assed cash grabs, there is the general feeling that the quality of games is trending downwards. Another factor at play here is the popularity of older games, a topic we covered just recently. A quick look at the top selling games of 2016 on Steam shows you that the vast majority of top sellers were games from 2015 or earlier. So there has been a definite trend towards playing older games instead of newer ones on the PC. So why is this happening? Well, older games are much cheaper than their newer counterparts thanks to regular massive discounts. 
Take Dishonored 2, for example. The game launched in November 2016 and was priced at $39.99 on the PC and consoles. But during the winter sale, the original Dishonored was only about £3 to buy on Steam. This was an extremely good value proposition for many that would allow them to scratch the Dishonored itch without shelling out 40 quid. The value proposition, or basically what you're getting for your money, is actually really important to most gamers. Publishers often disregard this fact and cut content from the finished product in order to bundle it as a pre-order incentive or DLC. This trend infuriates many of us who feel, or are at least subconsciously aware, that spending £40 no longer nets you a full experience at launch. Games feeling in some way incomplete because of this chopping up of content is a very real issue, but some publishers are learning. EA kicked Star Wars Battlefront out the door in a hurry with no single player campaign and a bare bones multiplayer to coincide with the release of The Force Awakens in cinemas. They got slammed by the community and got a lukewarm response from critics, but when Battlefield 1 came out last year, it did have a single player campaign, and it had a deep and robust multiplayer, and it got much better reviews as a result. But we've still not discussed the most crucial part of the study by Finder. It revealed that the best year for games was in fact 2001. 2001 saw the release of a whole host of critically acclaimed games, the likes of Max Payne, GTA 3, the original Halo, Super Smash Bros. Melee, Metal Gear Solid 2 and Final Fantasy X. All these games are considered classics and are widely adored. These games were all released during a time where developers and publishers didn't use tactics like season passes, DLC and day one patches. Marketing was less sophisticated and the lack of platforms like YouTube made it harder to just manufacture hype out of nowhere. Technology was more limited at the time too, so the games had to speak for themselves. PS2s and Xboxes weren't all hooked up to the internet for day one patches and updates. If a game was released as a broken mess, everybody knew about it, everybody avoided it, and there was nothing a developer could do to fix it. In many ways, the day one patch has just screwed us all over. Things can be fixed after launch now, so delays are less likely, and patches are just a fact of life now, they're just expected. So as a result, there's less motivation for publishers to make sure a game is finished before they kick it out the door. When pre-orders, season passes and deluxe editions are such a big part of the games industry business model, games will always feel a little bit incomplete or lacking in some way, and that is bound to affect the reviews which aren't updated when the games get updated. But while the likes of Naughty Dog, CD Projekt Red and even id Software with the latest Doom installment are releasing polished, feature-packed experiences, there will always be awesome games on the market and prove to all the video games executives out there that taking your time to finish a game before release is a good business decision. We don't think games are getting worse per se, but attitudes within the industry do need to change to be more about quality and less about marketing and all that cash grabbing bullshit. So that's about it from us. Do you think that games are getting worse or do you think that reviewers are getting more critical or any of the reasons listed by us above? Let us know down in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. Hit subscribe if you're new around here. Check out some more of our content around about here and we'll see you again next time. Bye for now.